on June 8, 1810, a young baby was born in a little town known as Vyak in Germany, and he later became one of the most famous composers of the Romantic era. His name was Robert Alexander Schumann. Robert's father, August Schumann, was a novelist and a translator of Walter Scott and Byron. August married Johanna Christian Schanbel and they had five kids, including Robert, four boys and one girl. Johanna gave birth to Robert at the age of 40, and Robert was raised by sister Emile Schumann. At Robert's early age, his father discovered his talents in music. His father brought the seven-year-old Robert to his first piano teacher, Johann Gottfried Kunst, in the most famous organist in town. With Schumann's talent, he composed his first well-known choral piece at the age of 11, Psalm 150, and he published it in the music concert held by his piano teacher. Robert's childhood reached its end, however, at the age of 15. His sister Emila had passed away due to health complications, soon followed by their father a year later for similar reasons. In his testament, however, Robert's father declared that Robert shall gain an extra grant if he decided to study abroad. Robert's mother and brothers, however, went against his pursuit for music, so at the age of 17, Robert went to Leipzig for the study of law. Although Schumann arrived in Leipzig for the study of law, what he sought the most was music, literature, and getting a hangover. Robert's interest in literature began at the age of seven, when he studied Latin and Greek in a private school in Zwickau. Robert's favorite novelist was Jean-Paul Richter, one of the most famous romantic novelists at the time. He once claimed to his friend that he learned more about counterpoint from Jean-Paul Richter than any other music teacher. Robert's first composition, Papillon, was composed in 1832 under the inspiration of Jean-Paul Richter's Flegeljahre. He once said, what Jean-Paul had done to his creation is exactly what I want to express, Papillon. In 1828, at the age of 18, Robert became the student of Friedrich Weick under the help of the Caris family. Robert wrote a letter to his mother, claiming that he'd give up his studies in law to pursue music. He also said that under the instructions of Friesen, he is confident that within six years, he'll become one of the most successful and Robert's dream of becoming a pianist was influenced at the time by many other first-class composers, most of which were also first-class pianists including Chopin, Mendelssohn, and Hummel. They often played their own pieces which would garner the attention of the audience which would lead to their publishing by famous publishers. It was near standard procedure. Unfortunately, Robert's dream of becoming a first-class performer only lasted three years. Since he began receiving professional music training in his early 20s, he spent all of his time practicing piano but he soon realized his ring finger on his right hand was far weaker than his other fingers and lacked the necessary strength to play as he wished. So he started practicing on heavier keys to increase the strength of his fingers. One day, in July 1831, Robert wrote in his diary, My dear Robert, don't lose your courage if it is not flowing and going so well. Like in the last eight days, practice patience. Lift your fingers quietly and hold your hands still and play slowly, and everything will come together. But it wasn't long before Robert discovered the stiffness in his right hand, including both his index and ring finger. Robert tried many ways to cure himself, seeing doctors and doing folk remedies. He soon discovered that the best cure was to relax. However, Robert refused to relax, as he still wished to become a first-class performer within three years. Eventually, he used the dactylion, a mechanism that held back one finger while he exercised the others. It was supposed to strengthen his index finger, but eventually ended up causing permanent damage to his right hand. Robert's mental stage was extremely unstable after he soon realized that he would never become the great composer he could have been. In his letters to his friends, words such as upset and depressed appear often enough. Under the guilt of not stopping Robert in time, his teacher Friedrich supported Robert's studies and other music-related careers such as composition. When he had the chance, he put Robert's composition in his concerts, and the performers of the pieces were his daughter, Clara Weig, or later known as Clara Schumann. Robert met Clara at the age of 18 when she was at the age of 9, but it wasn't a romantic story to start with. 
Robert had seen Clara as more of a competitor. She was extremely talented, well taught, and well raised by one of the greatest musicians of the time, who was also her father. The relationship between Robert and Clara changed due to Robert's hand injury in 1832. Because Robert had to give up his performance career, he became closer with Clara. She'd often play his pieces in her recitals arranged by her father, and the two became friends. After Robert broke up with one of his girlfriends, Clara realized that she was in love with Robert. For Robert, Clara was there for him during his darkest time. By then, Robert was also touched by the young girl. A sense of love was evident between the two. At Clara's 18th birthday, they had their first kiss at Robert's hometown, Zvika, and confessed to each other as their love of their lives. Robert soon confessed this to Friedrich, but it angered him. At the time, Robert was not a famous musician yet, and the marriage between the two may ruin his daughter's career in music. She was well talented and well gifted. And so Friedrich used the excuses of recitals and took Clara away from Robert for close to a year, but this only built up their love for each other. In 1840, Clara decided to leave her father and marry herself to Robert. On September 12, 1840, at the wedding of Robert and Clara had taken place. Robert worked with Liszt and composed the famous Liebeslied S566 as his wedding gift for Clara. He dedicated all of his ambitions and patience to her within this music, and Robert's climax of his life begins here. In 1845, Robert created a new music magazine with his friend, known as Die Neue Zitfried für Musik, or in English, The New Journal of Music. This journal recorded most of Robert's analyses of different composition as a music critic. Robert's words had magic as he used his own fictional style of illustration to illustrate his views on a piece. Eusebius came in quietly the other day. You know, the ironic smile on his pale face with which he seeks to create suspense. I was sitting at the piano with Florestan. Florestan is, as you know, one of those rare musical minds which anticipate, as it were, that which is new and extraordinary. Today, however, he was surprised, with the words, Hats off, gentlemen! A genius! Eusebius laid a piece of music on the piano rack. Robert had two sides to his personality, one impulsive, fiery, and energetic. The other was dreamy, reflective, and thoughtful. The one with all of burning fashion was named Floristin, a character from Beethoven's opera Fidelio, and the other was named Eusebius. From 1834 to 1843, Robert remained as the leading editor of the journal, and he published countless amounts of analyses himself. From Schubert to Brahms, Beethoven to Wagner, Robert changed how music was analyzed throughout his time. He made the boring analyses fun to read, like bedtime stories. Robert's music critic career had given him a steady income to support his family and his interests. His improvisation skills were always the biggest part of him, but due to his insufficient music training in his early age, a good portion of his improvisations were not recorded by himself which he saw in his later years in a letter to Clara, in which he wrote, If an idea were ever to make its mind up, please quickly record it down into your score. Sometimes the expansion of music covers up the original improvisation, and thus leaving it with no trace to track. Robert lacked the professional music training in his early years. Most of his compositions were half-improvised, and this may have been why he hardly had any completed works before his 30s. Like his favorite poet, Jean-Paul, he was a successful novelist that lacked the ability to tell a complete story. Robert started composing his first 20 opus numbers with his most familiar instrument, the piano. In his later years, he composed massive pieces such as Faschingswank aus Wein, also known as the Carnival Prank from Vienna, under the inspiration of Franz Schubert. By 1831, at the age of 21, Robert's hand injury had gotten worse as he tried to touch the piano once again. At about the same time, his mental state had worsened. It was claimed by some of his friends that Robert's family always had some mysterious relationship with mental instability. It is believed that his sister and his father may have died of it. Regardless, the majority of Robert's family members had passed away during their 30s, so Robert doubted his lifespan throughout his life. In one of his letters he wrote to Clara in 1836, he wrote, I need to hurry up with processing my compositions, because I have already used more than half my life. He was only 26 when he wrote this. In 1844, Robert's family and friends began passing away one after another. On his way to Dresden, Robert had his first mental breakdown. He experienced heavy sleeping disorders and blanks to his music. Clara wrote this in her letter to their friend Brahms, saying, 
There was about a week where he couldn't sleep at all. I often saw him sitting silently and crying. He couldn't walk. He needed support everywhere he went. In Robert's last few years, he said, I've seen people holding my work, telling me that they weren't made by me, and all I could do was scream. It wasn't like that. In 1854, Robert attempted suicide by jumping down into the Rhine River. Ironically, one of his most famous and joyful works of all time, the Danish Symphony, was named after the river. He was saved by a boatman, and under his own request, was sent to a mental treatment facility in Edenish. There, he was diagnosed with psychotic melancholia and depression. Robert was slowly losing clarity and control over his mind, but the will to create music was still along his side. One of his friends, Brahms, visited him and said, he can still play, but for most, his improvisations were fiddles. He couldn't tell which notes were out of tune. On July 29, 1856, a month after his 46th birthday, in two days after Clara's last visit, Robert Alexander Schumann passed away from pneumonia in the psychiatric hospital in Edinburgh. Robert's life was full of tragedy and story. He piled his life up with music and literature. He was the man that carried both the words of lucky and unlucky. He had his passions for music. He had a good teacher. He had a beautiful childhood, and he had Clara Schumann, the girl that left her family for him. Clara faced the uncertainty of living with Robert for the next ten years after their marriage eventually lived as a widow with Robert's compositions for the rest of her life. Robert's life may have been a lot different if he was raised in a different family, or if he had received professional music training at his young age. But after all, this is the life of Robert Alexander Schumann, a man who left his own works onto the history of the Romantic era and his stories that inspired many artists after him.